Good morning, happy Wednesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, well, today is Wednesday. That means that tomorrow's Thursday, 6 a.m. Tomorrow morning, Coffee and Coaches Conference call as usual. It's a great Q&A with a great group of people, um, a lot of great practitioners and strength coaches on these calls. Um, sharing a lot of great information. So grab a cup of coffee. Please join us, 6 a.m. The uh, link will be on my professional Facebook page just prior to the call. All right, digging into today's Q&A. This is with Manuel, but it's an extension of a discussion that we had in regard to Nivaris and Valgus. Um, So Taya, I believe it was Taya that brought up this um, a few calls ago. And uh, what we did is we sort of extended this representation as to why we would see one presentation over the other. And this is in regards to position of the center of gravity and and actually axial configuration. So actually the shape of the axial skeleton is gonna help determine whether you're gonna see a varus or valgus show up under many circumstances. Then we talk about sequencing is how we would address this in the gym. So those of you that are subscribed to the YouTube channel probably have a little taste of this. Um, When we look at the the simple solutions for uh, medial knee pain and lateral knee pain that that I posted up there. The medial knee pain is going to be more related to the valgus representation. The lateral knee pain is going to be more represented to the varus representation for those of you that are looking for ideas for activities and then again sequencing of events to address these issues. If you would like to participate in a 15-minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. Put 15-minute consultation in the subject line so I don't delete it. We'll arrange that at our mutual convenience. Everybody have an outstanding Wednesday. I will see you tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., Coffee and Coaches Conference call. Hey, Bill. I want to follow up on the discussion. Um, So you mentioned that um, that the the valgus and the varus also kind of depends on the force that you're putting into uh into the ground yes sir. so would you say that the that the narrows would be more biased towards that varus uh presentation because they have that more of that er as they are pushed forward anyway compared to a wide who is going to be more ir as they get pushed forward it, it, it's going to be all right it's going to be less about a narrow and a wide and it's going to be more about the configuration because of the the downward and upward bias, okay? Okay. So so if you take somebody that has a a pelvis with a larger circumference than the thorax. The pylons. Yes, sir. So they have have a, a prominent downward velocity, right? And so you're gonna see you're you're gonna see more of a of a um what would be referred to in, in valgus. Oh, man, that word just gets a little caught in my throat. Uh, no, you, you're, you're going to see that the, the knees coming inward a lot more under that circumstance. Okay. Somebody that would be in a, in a more, um, the bowed representation, which where you have the superimposition of ER, they're going to be moving upward more because that, that requires the, the ER bias. Does that make sense? So yeah, remember, so IR is down, ER is up. So if 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 I'm moving up and out, so I'm turning up and out that way, that's going to create more superimposition of external rotation, which is going to allow me to move further forward. Okay. And so then okay. you're going to see the, the bowed appearance. If I'm IR bias, I got to turn down and in. Uh, so so uh, following that then the the flatter cylinder the shorter cylinders would have more of that ir force going into the ground they would be more uh valgus compared to the longer cylinder configurations uh it's more about like i said it would be more about the differential between the two okay okay Mm. it's gonna it's gonna yeah because uh, again it it, because it's an up and down thing more than anything else. Yeah, I was thinking about the flow between the t- those two. Right. Uh, no, I, I I I know exactly where you're coming from, but but um, that that would be like saying there's no such thing as a bow-legged powerlifter when all you gotta do is go to the powerlifting gym and you would see it, see them all over the place, right? Right. Yeah, but they're slightly biased. Again, one of the reasons why they're probably really good powerlifters is is they gotta. Granted, they their their differential is not significant from top to bottom, right? They're they're very 
thick in, in both the thorax and the pelvis, but they got just enough differential that, that they're going to slide forward more and they're going to ER more. Mm -hmm. you, won't, you won't find too many, I don't know, I, I, I haven't looked at this in a long time, but visually speaking, I don't think you're going to find too many, too many really good power lifters that are walking around with what would be called a valgus knee. No, not really. I can't, think of, I can't think of any off the top of my head anyway. No, but, but I, I, don't, I don't look at that stuff. But I do see the Varus uh, presentation a lot. Like they walk like the Cowboys, you know, or the Harley yes, Davidson yes. riders. There you go. You know, yes. Thing. So. yes. And then, um, uh, you know, following up with what uh, Zach was talking about, um, with that differential, um, you know, he, how, would, how would that be reflected in the gym? Like, would the solution still be? It seems it seems kind of which, similar. Which differential are you talking about, boss? Well, I, I, in terms of uh, when he was talking about uh, looking at the knee, whether just going after the tibia first or or the whole thing, uh -huh. uh, based on the how I guess eccentrically oriented the VMO is, it seems yes. like in both cases, you know, you would still want to just uh, <clears throat> you know make sure that uh, that you know. It, they, they, it's systemic so you want the hip to be in a good position you want the right yes, foot with you and then maybe going yeah. to something like a split squat or something yeah. That, yeah i mean so from a training standpoint which is where i come from more yeah it, it seems like the the let's say the treatment but at least the experimentation would be the same or similar very similar i don't know if there's a yeah something, so, there but something to look out the only, for. Yeah, the, the, only the only difference here is that you're just not going to lay hands on somebody to promote the change. You're going to have to you're gonna have to be really, really good with your exercise selection and, and understand where you've got access to, to movement, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the places where you're going to have to create some of the, the rotations um, is, is at 90 degrees of knee bend at the knee, okay? And then when you're trying to approximate the hip, you have to prevent some of the motion at the knee, right? Because you don't want the compensation. So if you had somebody that walked in with like the, uh, you know, okay, so you're working with uh, the rodeos in town and they go, hey man, well, we want to get a lift in. And um, they come walking in with their high heeled boots on, right? And, and you know, they, you're, you're throwing the basketball around and the guy's standing there with his feet close together and you bounce the basketball to him, he misses it, but it goes between his knees. Right. So he's got the <clears throat> he's got the big bow. Right. So um, if you're trying to address the hip first, you're going to have to put the, the lower extremity in a position where the knee cannot make the compensation first. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be in, that's going to be in um, exercises where that knee is a little bit straighter. OK, that would emphasize the hip turn. Right. You could control the hip more because the knee is in a position where it wouldn't move as much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then once you get the hip under control, now you got to put them in a position where the knee has access to motion and that's where the knee is more bent. Got it. Right? So it seems like in one case, you could do something more like a half kneeling, whereas in the second case, you have something more like a split squat. Uh, I, would, I would look at it more from the perspective of like if, if you were uh, putting somebody, they were standing and you had them put one foot up on a step, mm -hmm. the downside foot that's still on the ground would have, you would have greater control of the turn of the hip. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You see how, because because the knee is, is almost straight. Mm -hmm. and, and so there would be less rotation available at the knee, but I have a lot of rotation at the hip. So now I'm influencing the foot and the hip in that circumstance. So I set that up. So I do something, some kind of activity there first. Then I go after like the half kneeling split squat, split squat stuff. Okay. And then I then I have more access to knee. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Okay. So cool. there's a little bit of sequencing that that comes into play that's helpful. And that doesn't mean you can't knock it out of the park with one exercise, which you can like. You could go right to a split stance activity, Manuel. If you got somebody that's got great control and, and you're you're the best coach of the day kind of a thing, you can knock it out of the park with one activity, right? 
you just got to make sure that, that number one, you can see what you need to see and they understand what you want them to do. And then there's other times where <clears throat> maybe you don't have that level of communication and maybe it's a, it's a Wednesday instead of a Thursday and you come in and you're a little, you know, you're a little off. Right. And then maybe you need two exercises. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's cool.